Welcome to Asian Voices, I'm Aiko Doden. On this edition and the next, we'll be discussing major decisions Japan is facing. Today, we are looking at two ideas for free trade zone in Asia. Take a look at this chart. The overlap of these two free trade areas in Asia has often been described as the noodle ball phenomenon. It's a complex situation that reveals each country's strategies. The US is at the heart of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, is focused on East Asia and involves China and 15 other countries. How will the US-China tug-of-war in Asia pan out? Where will Japan make it stand? We discuss these issues with experts from China, the US and Japan. Um, joining us from the US by telephone is Dr. Mireya Solis, Philip Knight's Chair in Japan Studies and Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. She is an expert on Japan and East Asian policies. And from China, Professor Jan Yun Lin of the Chinese Academy of Social Science. He is an expert on the international economy and especially on the Asia-Pacific regions. And with me in the studio is Professor Yorizumi Watanabe of the Policy Management Faculty at Keio University. He was the lead negotiator on the Japan-Mexico Economic Partnership Agreement. Well, thank you everyone for joining me today. Thank you very much thank you. for having me here. Thank you. Um, Dr. Solis, first of all, you know, the second term Obama administration's Asia strategy is focusing on security and the economy. And one pillar of that approach must be the TPP. That the US wants Japan to state that it will join talks, but Tokyo, including the previous administrations, have been unable to provide a positive response. Uh, Prime Minister Abe is said to be travelling to the US next month, and one focus will be the TPP. How important is it to the US that Japan comes on board? Uh, thank you very much, Doris, and I'm glad to participate in this program. Uh, let me start by saying that it is indeed very important for the United States to have Japan on board. And let me provide you a little bit of context as to why this might be the case. I think, first of all, it's important to realize that the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Initiative, is the single most important trade initiative currently under negotiation for the United States. It has allowed the United States to reposition itself. I think that the real concern before the TPP took uh, uh, off was that the United States would be sidelined from the process of Asian regionalism. Mm. Now the United States is playing, uh, playing a leading role in shaping an Asia-Pacific integration project. But the success of this enterprise really hinges on its expansion. For the TPP to succeed and to be able to generate substantial gains on trade and to be able to generate cutting-edge rules on trade and investment, it must recruit new members. And there is one member that, uh, whose participation could be transformative. That is Japan. Every single analysis done by economists show that the most gains from trade for the United States would happen if Japan joins in. There is also a convergence in the interests of the United States and Japan regarding the rules area of this agreement on issues like intellectual property and investment, where they could work together in trying to get, again, very high levels of integration. So the stakes are high, mm -hmm. but unfortunately uh, the, uh, Japan's participation has not been decided yet. And is it, as, um, Dr. Solis, is it also because the Japan's um, GDP volume constitutes a sort of a critical mass in terms of TPP negotiation? Is that one of the reasons why? That is correct. I mean, the size of the Japanese market would really make a difference. But I think uh, also you have to think about the ability to move forward the integration project, the fact that mm. both countries share many interests in uh, uh, developing these new rules, and therefore they could work together to bring this to a very high level. But also, there's one more effect, and this is what we like to call the snowball effect, in the sense that if Japan were to come on board, this would create incentives for other countries, perhaps like South Korea, to also join. So the idea is that you can bring together a critical mass of countries 
that therefore makes the TPP project all the more attractive. I see. So, Dr. Solis, does it mean that um, you know, if and when uh, Mr. Abe, Prime Minister Abe, visit the U.S., um, and, and if and when he cannot come up with a clear answer, do you think that the, the U.S. patients may, may run out as a result? I don't think it's going to run out because I think that the stakes are high. This is an, an opportunity to really raise the prospects for the TPP. It's also an ability to cement a, a, a deeper U.S.-Japan relation. So I don't think this is like the last chance. Mm. If it doesn't materialize during the uh, uh, visit of Prime Minister Abe, that would be the end of it. But I do think that there is a clear timeline. And the fact is that the TPP has been under negotiation for more than two years. Many countries would like to make 2013 the year when most, if not all, the negotiations are concluded. And therefore, the time is running out for Japan to actually come on board in time to have input. Mm -hmm. And Japan would like to leave its imprint on what is being negotiated at the TPP. Oh, I see. Thank you. Um, Professor Jan? Um, the TPP yes. brings together countries who share values and practices of free trade and democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, China is eager on RCEP framework, you know, a free trade framework of Southeast Asian nations plus um, other countries, uh, including Japan and China. Um, some see this as a sort of a leadership contest between the uh, US and China over a free trade zone in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, Dr. Solis also said that uh, the United States is seen as playing a kind of a leadership role uh, regarding TPP. Um, do you share this view that this is actually a kind of a, a leadership contest between the, the two powers? I think it is uh, not a competition of the leadership between the two because if you see the Asia Pacific, U.S. efforts made in the past for instance, try to create an uh, APEC-based uh, uh, community uh, during Clinton's time and during Bush time and try to create uh, the uh, FTAAP, but they all failed. And now it's TPP. So U.S. always tries to create this kind of U.S.-led, you know, uh, Asia-Pacific liberalization-based, the uh, integrated market. Uh, on East Asia side, the other efforts always happen in the past. 10 plus 1, mm -hmm. you know, uh, EFTA, CPA, now it's RCEP. So I think that, uh, you know, it's not uh, uh, a competition of the leadership between U.S. and, and, and China. It's actually, it's two efforts by the two kind mm -hmm. of different mm -hmm. models and different uh, driven interests and, and uh, groupings. I, uh, I, I, I think that is probably the fact. Right. So playing a sort of a complementary role, perhaps, Dr. Zhang? Uh, we, we hope that mm -hmm. because TPP tried to create, uh, you know, integrated market uh, framework with very high standard. But RCEP mm -hmm. have to consider the East Asia situation. They create create, you know, liberalization plus cooperation. Uh, that is why they call the, you know, uh, comprehensive economic partnership. Mm. So which I think fit East Asia, uh, you know, this uh, character and also demand for, for the future. We hope it's not, uh, you know, uh, tit for tat war mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. the two. And it's not, uh, you know, tried confrontal. We, we oh, try to oh. make the complementary in the future we can, you know, find a way how to integrate the two into one. I see. Well, um, Professor Zhan, if that is the case, uh, would China be comfortable with the idea of joining the TPP even and share values and practices of free trade and democracy with members including the U.S.? Or does uh, China see it more as a Washington consensus-oriented framework? What, what is your view? I, I think it's not a uh, you know, framework of democracy. You know, Vietnam uh, also joined. And uh, I think it's a model, different model. So China pay uh, very high attention to this development of TPP. But we understand the U.S. does not want China to join in the first group because it tries to make a very high standard. <coughs> And China is, is uh, you know, uh, uh, a big economy, big market will be 
uh, uh, you know, for bargaining very strong. So which probably I think U.S. worried about that. Mm -hmm. And also on China side, I think it's probably it's not ready to join at this moment. And that is we, we can do the others and see whatever happened. So that is probably the 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 general attitude of China's uh, uh, policy toward the TPP. So Professor Watanabe in our studio, it was very interesting to hear our yes, both indeed. guests speak mm -hmm. uh, their mm -hmm. uh, respective views on TPP mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. RCEP. Um, what is your view? I thought TPP was more a rule-oriented, rule-based mm -hmm. framework. Yeah, and certainly with uh, very high quality in mm -hmm. terms of uh, uh, market liberalization. Uh, market access is certainly drastically improved in TPP. Mm. But also, as you mentioned, uh, uh, rule-making uh, mm. function of TPP is very important mm. because, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Doha uh, development agenda, so-called Doha Round negotiation, uh, we could not really um, start the rule-making uh, mm. in the area of uh, trade and investment, trade and competition, or more transparency in the government procurement, or maybe control over uh, sovereign uh, state fund and so mm, forth. Mm. So perhaps uh, that's the TPP uh, where the, those rule making uh, could be uh, taken place. I see. Yeah. So that's why um, it is um, important in your in your view that mm -hmm. Japan Indeed. joins yes. the negotiation I think the sooner the is better. Yes. Phase of the mm. the rule making yes, phase indeed. rather indeed. than um, joining later and follow the mm -hmm. rules that mm -hmm. are already there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the worst scenario is uh, like uh, Japan, uh, you know, joins uh, TPP at the very end of negotiation uh, on the take it or leave it basis. Mm -hmm. You see, I think uh, Japan has full of idea about uh, investment, competition policies, or um, you know, the government procurement. So uh, I think Japan should uh, hurry up to uh, uh, join uh, TPP negotiations. I see, but with, rega with regards to TPP and RCEP, mm -hmm. um, some tend to ask questions like, is it RCEP either or, or. <laughs> TPP, but it's not yes. really an either mm. or question. Yeah, in, indeed. I think, uh, you know, it is not uh, uh, either or, uh, but uh, Japan should uh, seek both. Mm. And uh, Japan could eventually um, enjoy a very interesting sort of uh, pivotal position mm. uh, between two, because uh, RCEP, originally that was ASEAN plus six that Japan you know, proposed back in year 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Japan, in addition, had already concluded uh, about a dozen of uh, free trade agreements, mm -hmm. uh, mainly with ASEAN countries. So Japan is, uh, in that sense, very firmly involved in the making of free trade area in the region of East Asia. Mm -hmm. So Japan is deeply rooted in East Asia. And if Japan could join TPP uh, together with the United States, Australia, New Zealand, if we could make uh, more trade related rules, then those rules and uh, uh, the making of East Asia are certainly complementary. So mm -hmm. I quite uh, agree with uh, uh, Professor Jan mm -hmm. that it's complementary and it's not tit for tat competition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Japan should uh, make the best uh, uh, use of those, you know, intermediary mm -hmm. uh, position mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Japan could uh, eventually enjoy. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, Dr. Solis, uh, with regards to um, the U.S. trying to engage ASEAN countries uh, which are g going through um, drastic uh, development, you know, some ASEAN countries like Thailand uh, um, are expressing interest in talks about joining the TPP. Um, do you think, is it purely for economic reasons that the countries are making that option? Or do you think countries look to the U.S. as a power, as a sort of a security guarantor in the region where tension vis-à-vis -vis China over territory have become visible? Well, I think that, you know, we're all in agreement that fundamentally we're talking about free trade agreements and the agenda is mostly on the economic side of things. So I think that when ASEAN countries decide or look at the TPP membership, they're mostly based on this reading as to what are the economic opportunities being offered here. Um, so I agree very much with everything that has been said in the sense that we may have two different possibilities in the TPP and the RCEP, but this is not a zero-sum competition where countries are being asked to take sides. And the fact is that many of these ASEAN countries that are participating or are considering to participate in the TPP like uh, Thailand are doing both things. They want to have a 
leg on each side of these three negotiations because they see the benefits that they will enjoy from being present in both negotiation uh, fronts. I think that you can think of this more of a hedging strategy that you want to be active on both fronts and that you'll uh, derive the most benefit by doing so. Mm -hmm. And if I could um, ask you a question regarding the uh, U.S. Uh, shale gas development, um, which may have an impact on the uh, even on the trade agreement, uh, free trade agreement framework. Um, I understand, uh, Dr. Solis, it has now become a big part of the U.S. energy strategy. Uh, Japan's previous government was in talks with the U.S. to import cheap energy, but without an FTA uh, with the U.S., the talks fell through. Um, is the U.S. unable to export energy unless Japan becomes a party to the TPP? Well, this is a really interesting question. And the fact is that there are two very important trends that have come together. The one uh, first fact is that there is a real possibility that the United States could emerge as a very large exporter of liquefied natural gas because of the so-called shale gas revolution. And this happens at the same time that in the aftermath of the Fukushima nuclear uh, accident, mm -hmm. Japan is trying to rapidly increase its imports of LNG. But as you uh, uh, asked in your question, the fact is that the regulatory process in the United States for uh, natural gas exports is complicated. And in the absence of a free trade agreement, uh, it is necessary to obtain a permission from the Department of Energy to justify that such export of natural gas is in the public interest. Now, Japan has tried to obtain a waiver from this FTA requirement. There are some people in the United States that are making the case that this regulatory framework should be reformed. In my opinion, it is clear that an allied country like Japan should indeed should not face this kind of restriction in terms of natural gas exports. But if I may also add, I think there are more fundamental issues mm. at stake, and that is that the future itself of the United States as a major exporter of natural gas is a little bit uncertain because it is a hotly debated issue within the United States. First of all, because of the way in which these uh, natural gas is extracted, the technology is controversial from an environmental point of view. Mm -hmm. Second, there is an ongoing discussion as to whether the United States should indeed export large amounts. Some people say that this would indeed increase the domestic prices of natural gas. And third, I think realistically, we need to understand that the infrastructure for exports, large-scale exports, is not yet in place. It will take many years. So exports of natural gas are not going to be a short-term solution for Japan. Ah, oh, so thank you. Um, and uh, Professor Dan, um, I kind of touched upon uh, a little bit on the security aspect of the situation. Um, you know, Xi, Xi Jinping has made several comments on China um, becoming the maritime power and uh, of the great renewal of the Chinese nation. China has been abrasive with the ASEAN countries, which leads us to think that perhaps some ASEAN nations are also showing interest in the US-led TPP uh, because of that, uh, in order to balance. Now, what is your view of the situation, Professor Zhan? I think for uh, quite a long uh, time in the past, we tried to uh, settle down two things. One is to make, uh, manage our you know, disputes, to put on the law level, but now it seems, you know, uh, the disputes on the islands between China and Japan and at the uh, hotspot, and also uh, on South China Sea with the Vietnam and Philippines. Uh, but personally, I still, you know, uh, believe we, uh, you know, have to find a way how to cool down and find a way to, uh, you know, uh, 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 avoid the big uh, crisis. So China's, you know, call for um, a strong marine power, that is a past policy. Our main interest and policy focus is on the land. But now the sea, uh, you know, becomes more important as a, uh, uh, you know, route as a resource development. So that, 
means that China will put more attention to the development of uh, you know uh, the the marine resources and uh, security concern of this uh, you know trade and others and so on. So that is I think uh, puts a challenge on that. I, I I don't think that it means that China will try to create a domination or even you know, occupy any kind of the other disputed areas. We still, I think, is a happy.